so um, we're going to be talking about MFA today. Uh, this is uh, the first time I'm giving this specific talk, but I got really interested in this topic last year um, after Uber, Dropbox, Twilio, Cloudflare were all breached due to MFA. And I was like, what is going on here? Um, like, what's happening? Why is this happening? And I thought I understood what MFA was and how it works. By the way, my background is I have a PhD in cryptography. Um, I started in um, uh, network security in around 2004, 2005. And I thought I understood what uh, MFA was, but I didn't. And so I assume that given that I don't understand what this thing is, and this is like actually the thing that I'm like uniquely, you know, nerded out on, uh, nobody understands what MFA is or how it works. So you may think you understand what MFA is. What I want to do today is give you a deeper understanding of how MFA works. I don't think anyone else is going to present it this way, so we'll see what you guys think. But um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this space. And I think that this group is really well positioned to learn about it. I know you're not cryptographers and infosec people like me, but um, this community is the one that manages access to very important things, repo access, CICD pipelines, your identity provider, maybe that's not you, maybe that's a different group in IT, but all of this stuff, production access, who can log into your servers, who can touch your systems. If this stuff gets compromised due to an MFA breach, and you're like, well, I had MFA and I don't know why it didn't work, that's not a good position to be in, and that's kind of like where the tech industry was in 2022, so hopefully in 2023 we do better, okay? So that's the goal of this talk. Um, okay, so let's start with the, the simple stuff. Why do we need MFA? Well, over the last you know, 10 years, we've noticed that passwords get stolen, leaked, uh, fished, they get cracked, people find password files. Do you remember those old Yahoo breaches where someone stole the password file and was able to reverse all the passwords from the password hashes? So this is the kind of stuff that I was teaching in my InfoSec class in 2010. Um, and that stuff's like kind of old news. Um, credential stuffing attacks. I don't know if you've ever heard this terminology. It sounds really fancy, but it's really simple. It just leverages the fact that people reuse passwords across websites. So if someone um, compromises your, you know, your crappy um, Yahoo password, then maybe they can also get into your LinkedIn and your Mastodon, and hopefully not your bank account, but maybe also your bank account, right? So there's a lot of sort of well-known problems with passwords. The other problem with passwords is that they're long-lived. So if someone steals my password, Think about your bank password. When's the last time you changed your bank password, right? Um, people don't change it very often because it's usually a really strong password that they remember in their head and they don't write down anywhere. So it, even the most important passwords that we have that are strong are long-lived, right? And so the whole point of MFA is to solve this problem of long-lived credentials that live too long if they're stolen and used by someone else. You may not notice, right? That they're reused and that they're really um, leaking all over the place, basically, these days. So the premise behind MFA, and this is what we thought should work, um, is that if my password is stolen, you know, usually in some electronic fashion, like it's leaked on the dark web, or a password file was stolen, or something like this, um, then it's really hard for that attacker who got access to a password file, like those Yahoo password files. Does anyone remember that Yahoo breach where all the passwords were leaked? Yeah, so like the idea is if the attacker steals all those Yahoo password files, right, they're not going to also steal my phone. They stole a password file, they didn't steal my phone. So if I have MFA on my phone, they've got my password, but it doesn't help them get in because I've still got my phone and they haven't stolen my phone, right? So that's the idea behind an MFA. It's a really good idea. Um, there's lots of different ways that MFA is actuated, right? You can do it using possession of, proving possession of device. So I can prove to you that this is physically my phone, this is the phone, right? Or that it's physically my laptop. Um, it can prove that it's my phone number. A phone number is different from a phone, right? I can prove to you that it's a biometric. I have to admit, I don't know too much about biometrics, so I'm not going to talk about them today. We don't really see biometrics um, in DevOps systems very often, though. Mostly what we see is proof of possession of, of a device or a phone, right? So that's what I'm going to concentrate on. Okay, so from the list of breaches here, how many of these have people seen? Is any, did you guys watch this stuff happen last year? Yeah. Right, so first Twilio, um, Cloudflare, um, that was, those were MFA phishing attacks. And then who had heard of an MFA, fish, uh, MFA fatigue attack before this summer? Had anyone ever heard of that? Yeah, so we just started seeing MFA fatigue attacks uh, last year, in my opinion. That's another thing that we saw. So which one of these was MFA fatigue? Does anyone know which, one, which, which incident was that? Yeah? 
Uber, yeah. So Uber got the MFA fatigue, and now MFA fatigue is something we should all think about. So by the time I'm done talking here, hopefully you'll know what MFA phishing is and what MFA fatigue is, and to think about whether your MFA system is susceptible to these, to, to reason about these. If you have no idea how to do this right now, does anyone have any idea how to do this right now, to think about MFA phishing and fatigue in your, in your systems? Okay. Very, very vague, right? I actually personally found it very confusing myself when I started thinking about this. Okay, the other thing is, um, I don't know how many people saw this, but in January of last year, the government came out with a memo. Um, it was their uh, zero trust memo, moving the US government towards zero trust cybersecurity principles. This came out in January. Did anyone see this? Did, did, this, did this hit this community? Yeah, so this is really interesting because in this they say a lot of really cool things and I was reading this at the time and I was like, wow, this is like so forward thinking. And one of the things that the government says was uh, agencies must use strong MFA. Um, look at the second bullet point. Um, phishing resistant MFA is required. And I was reading that and I was like, and this whole, this whole memo is all about use hardware keys in everything. Use hardware keys for everything. Phishing resistant MFA hardware keys. And I was like, these guys are overdoing it. This is too much. So this was me in January 2022. Me in January 2023 was like, hmm, maybe we should have listened to them, right? Because look what happened. So, so let's go through and see what happened um, and, and see what we can learn. Okay, and if you actually look, I wrote a blog post about this in January 2022. And in there I say, phishing resistant MFA, I don't really think it's necessary. We're probably fine with TOTP. And I would say that I was wrong. Okay, that was there. It's not okay. I was wrong about that. Okay, so, um, so let's learn about different types of MFA. So what I'm gonna do is I do the standard thing. This is kind of like what I do in my InfoSec class. I teach an InfoSec class at BU, which is we're gonna learn about something and then we're gonna learn what the attacks are. Okay, so we're gonna do four different kinds of MFA. Phone-based MFA, which is what is used in most consumer technology. Um, TOTP, which is what you probably use at work. Uh, Push-based MFA, which you may use at work. And WebAuthn, which you probably don't use at work. Can I see a show of hands? How many people use WebAuthn at their, at their job? We have one hand. OK. How many people use TOTP or know that they're using TOTP? OK, so TOTP is the thing where you, um, your Google Authenticator with all the codes. Has anyone seen this thing? Like these codes on the phone? How many people use that? Yeah, so this is roughly the standard. That doesn't surprise me. Phone-based MFA for your job? Interesting. Okay, cool. All right, so let's look at all of these. Let's look at their strengths and weaknesses and see what we can learn. Okay, so phone-based MFA. I'm presenting here an example to you. This is logging into Chase. This is what's used by most commercial, um, commercial sites, right? You log into your bank. Um, almost all banks use phone-based MFA. You log into your bank. Um, it gives you a code, you type in the code, and, um, and that proves that you possess your phone number, possess your phone number, okay? So typing in a code from your phone proves that you can actually receive phone calls at that phone number, okay? So what you're doing in this MFA is that you're, you're proving that you possess the phone number, you can receive calls or SMSs at that phone number, and that the code is short-lived, right, because it only lasts for however long, usually 10 minutes for something like a bank, right? And so the good thing here is this solves the problem of like your long-lived bank password, right? Because this code only lasts for 10 minutes. Um, and it also solves the problem of someone steals your bank password from the dark web or it leaks somehow, because then they would also have to steal your phone number, okay? Does that make sense? So this is the most popular consumer technology because most people know how to receive phone calls and most people know how to receive SMSs and type in a code. Okay, um, the problem is that there are a lot of attacks that are actually quite well known on this type of technology. Um, and we really saw them um, in, you know, mostly business applications, but also in, if you saw anything like um, cryptocurrency uh, websites, they actually, consumer, it's consumer tech that does not use this system anymore because the system has been attacked so often in that world of consumer tech. So there are places where this is no longer done. I'm honestly still surprised that like business bank accounts still use this technology. That drives me crazy. But um, I understand why consumer bank accounts still use this technology, but it's crazy to me that business bank accounts still do. Okay, so what's the problem? So the problem with phone-based MFA, and the reason that we don't use it in business applications, usually, hopefully, is because um, possession of a phone number, it's actually not that hard to steal your phone number. 
I mean, it is hard, but it's not that hard to steal your phone number. If someone really wants to steal your phone number, like for instance, you're the CEO of a company who may have a bank account, um, then they could, right? And how could they? They could by, um, there's two techniques that are, that are uh, well known here. The, the one you may have heard of is SIM swapping attacks. How many people have heard of SIM swapping? Okay. So SIM swapping is simply theft of your phone number. It's an adversary comes and they steal your phone number. They take the phone number off your phone and they put it on their phone. So now phone number, phone calls that were supposed to come to you now go to the adversary. That's all that SIM swapping does. I'll show you how they do it but it really just taking your phone number and moving it from your device to some other device, so they're receiving your phone calls, they're receiving your texts. If the adversary is receiving your texts, they'll receive your MFA, they'll be able to enter your code, and they can impersonate you. So they need to steal your password, and they need to steal your phone number, and then they can impersonate you. That, that part's clear? Makes sense? Okay. The other way to steal your phone number is with SS7. Who has heard of the SS7 protocol? Who has heard of BGP? You guys have heard of BGP? Okay, this is BGP for phones, basically. SS7 is like BGP for phones. It's really, really super old, um, and it, it lacks a lot of the safeguards of modern uh, routing protocols. So either one of these techniques will allow the adversary to steal your phone number, and if they can do that, they can, they can break your MFA. Right? So just a quick example, a quick explanation of what a SIM swapping is. Basically, the attacker learns various things about you. They call the phone company. They say, oh, I have a problem with my phone. Can you please fix it? Can you transfer my phone number onto my new phone? And the phone company's like, oh, okay, da 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 and they send the phone. They basically transfer your phone number to the adversary's phone. Now the thief gets your calls, and they can impersonate you to the MFA. There have also been SIM swapping attacks that are known where the adversary went and bribed employees of the phone company to change the mapping of phone numbers to phones. And in that way, they were doing MFA. Uh, in that way, they were able to do SIM swapping attacks. And the reason they do this is, is for um, MFA attacks and for um, recovery attacks. A lot of times, password recovery goes through your phone. So if the adversary can steal your phone number, they can steal your. They can steal you through password recovery, right? So, in business applications, in my opinion, and I say this with 100% confidence, if you can avoid using phone-based MFA, you should because there are too many ways to exploit the telephone system that you just don't want to have to worry about. We have better tech for this. And in a business environment, when you have employees, you can ask them to learn how to use an authenticator app. Right? Um, in a commercial technology, it's maybe not so possible. But in a business application, I think it is possible. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Should I take any questions or just keep going? You know, I'm, I'm fine if anyone wants to ask anything. But I'll, I'll just keep going. If people have anything they want to say, please just. Um, Put your hand up and interrupt me. Um, SS7 attacks, I used to think were very obscure. Um, SS7, again, is the protocol that runs the telephone network. Uh, the main defense that this, pro this protocol has is that it's very hard to get like, into the telephone network if you're not a telephony provider. So people won't really connect to you unless you are a telephony provider. And so the security of the SS7 network used to be based on the fact that it's hard to just enter the network at all. But, this, but in, once you're in the network, security is terrible in summary, right? What's happened is that there are, as you know, malware for hire of all sorts of shapes and forms on the internet today. And so now, if you actually go look, there's a whole like ecosystem of um, SS7 malware that will allow you to do things like steal phone numbers. And it's actually pretty easy. If you just Google it, you'll find it. So it's not even that hard to find. Um, and so this, this is the reason that phone-based MFA, I think, is, it should be completely deprecated at this point, at least for business applications. For commercial applications, it's better than nothing. But for business applications, I think it's important that we don't use these anymore in our systems. OK. So that is my, that's my conclusion of phone-based MFA. You're probably wondering if we can do phishing attacks on phone-based MFA. The answer is yes. Um, the thing is, though, that you can do phishing attacks on a lot of things. So I'm going to explain phishing attacks in a second. We're going to go see the next technology before I explain phishing attacks. OK. All right, so uh, TOTP. So TOTP is this technology. If you've ever used Google Authenticator, I'm sure that you've used this before. Um, uh, what it, TOTP stands for is time-based, one-time password. And basically, what you're doing here is you're proving that you possess the phone. Not the phone number, but the phone, right? So with this technology, the idea is we know that adversaries can steal our phone numbers if they really want to, if they're really determined. But it's a lot harder to physically take my phone and walk away with it, right? If I'm in North Korea, you can probably steal my phone. If the adversaries in North Korea, they can probably steal my phone number. If they're adversaries in North Korea, they probably can't get my phone and walk away with it, right? So this is a stronger mechanism if it works properly. 
Okay, so how does it work? It's really simple. You have a phone. Um, you have something you're trying to authenticate to, like your identity provider, like your Okta or your G, uh, G Suite or Azure AD, whatever it is. Um, and this doesn't have to be. It can just be a website. Like I'm authenticating here to HubSpot. I can authenticate to Carta. I can authenticate to my payroll software, whatever it is. Um, and so what happens is that there, when you set up the authenticator app on your phone, what it does, like every time I set up one of these rows in my authenticator app, my phone remembers a key that the service also remembers. So in this HubSpot example, I have a key that I share with HubSpot. And so this is the gold B at Bastion Zero at HubSpot key that's stored in my phone. HubSpot has the same key. And whenever I need to authenticate, what happens is both of us compute this uh, function here, which is just you take the key, you take something that's based on the time, the current time, you hash that all together. For those of you who care, the hash is HMAC. Um, and then you get a number, you get like a long string, you chop that down into six digits, and that's the code. That's what this protocol does. So you take the key, the time, you HMAC that, you truncate it, and then you get these things. And every, t every 30 seconds, this will change. Okay, that's TOTP. So it's a really cool protocol because it proves possession of the phone because the key should only be in your phone. So the only way the adversary, only way the adversary should be able to get your key is by stealing your phone. So we've eliminated SS7 attacks, we've eliminated SIM swapping attacks. Great, okay? This is where we were in the beginning of 2022, I would say. This was state of the art. So what happened? This is um, an example, this is a real example from a Cloudflare blog that they published in August of how their TOTP was fished, okay? So here's what happened. We had an adversary, the adversary's over here, and the adversary was spamming um, employees with this message that you can see here. And the message was like, please go to cloudflareocta.com. So cloudflareocta.com looks like a legitimate website. This might as well be called evil.com, okay? Because this is the adversary's website. So this is the phishing site. So don't name your, so lesson number one, if you're an adversary, don't call your website evil.com, but let's all mentally model this as evil.com. Okay, so users like, great, I'm gonna go to evil.com. And this is what it looks like. I'm, I'm, these are screenshots from Cloudflare, by the way. So evil.com had this thing over here. And I was like, cool, I have to do something. Let me log in. This looks like a login, username, password, MFA. Okay, so what they did was they typed in their username, they typed in their password, they looked on their authenticator app, they pulled their MFA, right? What you would normally do. The problem was that the site that they did this on was not a real Cloudflare website. It was evil.com. What does the adversary do? In real time, goes and replays those exact credentials to the actual login of Cloudflare, okay? Now you've logged in as the user. Do you guys see it? Okay, that's it, that's the phishing attack. So an MFA phishing attack is when you fool the user into going into evil.com, putting in all those credentials, and then relaying them in real time to the actual site. Now you've logged in as the user, you're in, you can do all kinds of things, change the password, change the authenticator, turn off the authenticator, move around, do whatever you wanna do next. You're in, okay? This is what we saw in 2022, for the most part. Okay, let me take a breath here, because I think this is important. Do you, any questions on this? Okay, cool. So you can read this in the Cloudflare bug, but that's all it is, it's really simple. You trick people to go to the wrong website, they put in their credentials, including the MFA, and it's related to the real site you're in. So, so that's the problem that we have, MFA phishing. You can see that this would happen whether you use TOTP, like proof of phone, or whether you use uh, like phone-based MFA, proof of phone number, right? In all these cases, you're putting in a code. If you put the code into the wrong site, you're hosed, that's it, right? The adversary gets your credentials. Okay, next thing. So there's a thing called push-based MFA. Has anyone ever used push-based MFA? Okay, great. So with push-based MFA, there is no code, right? So we don't really have the phishing problem, but we have a different problem. So this is an example of push-based MFA that I found on the internet. Um, again, you have your phone. Your phone stores some kind of secret. And what happens is um, whenever you log into the thing, it will, it will call out directly to your phone and it will say, um, would you like to approve this access request? Right, so I'm logging into my... Um, you know, my Cloudflare uh, identity provider, and, you know, I finish the login, I get this 
push notification to my phone, I, pr I press yes, and then I log in, right? And so the good thing about this is this is actually like, um, we don't have codes, we don't have to type codes and make mistakes and be worried that a code is gonna expire before we type it in properly. That is a real thing with TOTP. I do TOTP all the time and it's always stressful, like you're doing a demo and you're gonna screw up the code, you know? Um, but uh, here you don't, you just press a button, everything is very nice. This is again proof of possession of your phone, right? Your phone is again gonna share a secret with whatever you're authenticating to, right? So theft of your phone number doesn't matter here, it's theft of your phone that's the issue. Right? And we're not typing in codes that we can replay to the adversary because the site is calling directly out to your phone. You're not typing in a code that could then be phished and then passed on. Right? The phishing attack, by the way, if you've ever heard the term man in the middle attack, the phishing attack is a really a man in the middle attack. Right? There is no man in the middle attack here because the phone is talking directly to the website without something getting in the middle. Okay, but what is wrong with this system? So this looks really good, right? There's still something wrong with this. This was what happened in the Uber breach. This was the Uber breach. This was what was exploited in the Uber breach. Okay? Okay, MFA fatigue, let's see a picture. We have the adversary. Now what's the adversary doing this time? Instead of making us go to evil.com and typing in credentials, he's actually logging in as me. He's got my password, he's gonna log in as me. Great. What does the system do? It sends me a push notification to my phone, to my actual phone, which is where it's supposed to go. And I'm like, hmm, I didn't see this push notification. I should ignore this. Ignore, ignore, right? And so, do you guys see how this would work, right? So, basically, you lo the adversary logs in as you. The push notification, instead of going to the adversary, actually goes to you. Great. Now, if you're smart, you'll ignore it because you never initiated this login. Why are you getting a push notification? Right? What happens in MFA fatigue is the adversary will just keep sending you the push notification until you get confused and you click OK to make it stop. That was what happened in the Uber breach. So they just kept doing this, this line at the bottom, just do it over and over and over and over again until you get tired. You're like, OK, finally it stopped. Now I can get on with my life, right? And you just got attacked. I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. This is social engineering, right? Because actually what they did what they did, I mean, this is, a, this is from supposedly the attacker. I was spamming employee with push auth for over an hour, then I contacted him on WhatsApp, claimed to be from Uber IT, and told him if he wants to stop, he must accept it. Well, he accepted it and I added my device. It's not funny though, it's not funny. There's something wrong with the technology here, guys. It's not the people, it's the tech. There's something wrong with the tech, okay? This is not okay. So, so we can't blame the people here, in my opinion. We have better tech than this. We don't need to have it be this way, right? Because it's, it's confusing. I think, look, I think the design is sensible, but we can see it's been exploited. So we actually have better solutions. Okay, so now let me show you the last, the last one. Yeah, in the blue shirt. Does the software have the same vulnerability as the In what sense? Hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a phishing, that's, that's true, I buy that, I buy that. So what you just described was very clever an attack where you would also learn the password, right? You would learn the password and then the, the MFA would go through. So you're right, there is, there is that form of phishing. I have to tell you that the push-based MFA still confuses me on the phishing front, so I actually think you've outsmarted me here. So you've just shown an attack that the adversary phishes you, gets you to yeah, relays your password to the real site. The real site will send you the push notification. You'll accept the push notification because you thought you were really logging in and then you get in. Yes, amazing. Okay, so we still have a problem with this. Okay, so this tech still is, isn't the right tech. So what can we do? So this is, this is um, I'm gonna skip this for now. So th this, this is where I want to, to talk about, um, I wanna talk about uh, WebAuthn. So WebAuthn is sometimes called FIDO. It's sometimes called hardware keys. People say, that we're gonna solve this problem with hardware keys. And I think that's kind of true, but I also think that's kind of not the point. Because if someone starts spamming me with notifications to push the button on my hardware key, then I may also still have a problem, right? So I wanna look into what this tech actually does so we can understand how it works. And I argue that the reason that WebAuthn works is because we have TLS, we have this thing called TLS. Okay, so TLS is the thing that makes the lock on your browser. Right, it's HTTPS, it's the way we communicate with the internet. So WebAuthn is a combination of public key cryptography and TLS, and that's what's stopping uh, these attacks. 
So the reason that no one understands this is because you have to understand web security and also cryptography to understand this, which are two things I understand, so hopefully I can explain them to you. Um, so here's how it looks. So we have three players in this protocol. Before, I've only been talking about your phone and your um, identity provider. We have the identity provider. We have the authenticator, right? I drew it as a phone. It could be a hardware key. I don't really care. What matters is that there's a secret key um, that this um, phone has, and it corresponds to a public key. So this is public key cryptography, like what you would see in a digital certificate, right? And the property is that the adversary can know the public key, but they won't know the secret key. You can use the public key to verify a signature, but that doesn't mean you can learn a secret key, okay? So what happens is that the identity provider that we're working against knows Alice's public key, um, and Alice will have a public key and a secret key associated with that identity provider stored in her phone. And so this is what happens in WebAuthn. Um, the IDP connects to your browser. It says, hi, I'm the IDP. I have a challenge for Alice that to her, for her to authenticate. Now, what your browser does is does this amazing thing, and it says, who am I talking to? Am I really talking to the IDP? So if the IDP is Okta, right? It's saying, is this really Okta? Because I'm speaking TLS to whoever sent me this message. And so I know it's Okta because I'm speaking TLS, right? Like when we use the internet and we browse to a website like Google, we know we're talking to Google because we have a certificate for Google. We see the little lock in our browser bar that tells us we're talking to Google. So we know we're really talking to Google, right? So your browser, unlike us humans that are dumb and we don't know who we're talking to, someone sets us a website called cloudflareocta.com and we think we're talking to Cloudflare, right? Um, the browser knows who it's talking to. It knows it's talking to uh, okta.com, right? So it's going to check that because it speaks TLS and it can check that with TLS. So I'm harping on this because this is the point. This is the key point of this tech. So what happens now? The browser speaks directly to your authenticator. Your authenticator is not talking to the internet. It's not talking to the uh, identity provider. It's just talking to your browser. It, the browser's telling it, I have verified that I am talking to Okta. OK, please give me, please respond to this challenge from Okta now. I'm telling you this is Okta, you can trust me because I'm a browser. I know TLS, I can verify certificates, the entire apparatus of web security is protecting me here. I'm really talking to Okta, please authenticate to Okta. The, um, the phone is like, cool, I'll authenticate to Okta. So basically it signs the challenge using the public key. The browser sends it back over to Okta, and then they can, Okta can use Alice's public key to verify that, she's really, that, that it's really talking to Alice, and everyone's happy. Okay, that's the, that's the technology here. So we're not, um, we're not like typing in codes anymore. We're just pressing good, like we're pressing OK. And we're pressing OK to the right thing because the browser has checked for us that we're really talking to Okta and not to the adversary. That's the key. So the key here is that your browser is involved. And the reason that people want to use hardware keys for this is because you can plug a hardware key into your laptop and have it talk directly to your browser without going out to the internet. Right? There are other ways to talk directly to your browser without going out to the internet. You don't have to use a hardware key. You can use like Windows Hello on your Windows machine. I think there's some, um, I don't, I'm a Windows user, so there's some other version of this for, for Mac and stuff like that that's like a hardware key on your computer that will talk to the browser. It doesn't matter what you use. It doesn't have to be a hardware key. It just has to be something that can talk to the browser and know it's talking to the browser and not to like the arbitrary internet. The browser will check that you're talking to the real place and now you can't get fished. OK, so let's look at this again. Why do we stop MFA phishing? Browser TLS makes sure the authenticator is actually talking to the identity provider, right? I had Google here before as the identity provider, right? Um, and the authenticator talks directly to the browser, not to the internet. So it's not like getting confused about who it's talking to or, wh or where the message came from. If you look at this picture here, like what happened here? Um, the, the user. Um, Sorry, not this one. If you look at this picture here, right, the user's kind of confused about who they're talking to because they're getting fooled into talking to this evil.com and they think it's like really Cloudflare or they think it's really Okta. In my picture, right, your phone will not release the code unless it's actually talking to something that put the code there. The only thing that put the code there is Okta. Your browser makes sure you're really talking to Okta and that's why you don't get phished, okay? So this isn't about hardware key or not hardware key. It's about your browser getting involved, protecting you with TLS, and making sure you're talking only to your browser and not to the arbitrary internet. OK? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Well, I was just going to mention, I think the key part of this is that the 
Web offsets are built into the browser. Yeah. Right? Part of the browser. Yeah. Which makes it usable. Yeah. Yeah, you're using the browser in an incredibly strong way. You're using web security here. We, like, we know web security, you know what I mean? And we sort of ignored it with MFA up until this point. And now WebAuthn is like, oh yeah, remember web security, let's use it. Let's use TLS and let's use TLS to solve the problem here. Um, yeah, and then in terms of the MFA fatigue, right? Again, you're talking directly to the browser. So you have to actually go to the actual website. You have to go to Okta.com for your authenticator to do the Okta.com authentication. Right, so you can't just go to like an arbitrary website or get sent to that website by the adversary because you're actually having to go there in order for this to initiate. In the back. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay, great question. So you're saying TLS. So this, the, this mechanism's security depends on the security of TLS. If TLS stops being secure, for example, if the web PKI fails, like your certificate for Google gets um, forged, then this mechanism it, it can no longer hold up. 100%, you are correct, that is true. So this security of this in, is inherited from the security of TLS. We need secure TLS for this thing to be secure. So the assumption is if TLS is secure, you're good, and if it's not, you're not. So we're relying on the security of TLS. So you've just pointed out, like, now we're going to go get attacks on the security of TLS, and that will wear this, you know, wear down into this protocol. But yes, at least we avoid sort of like the obvious mistakes. Um, I'm running out of time. What should I do? Wrap it up. <laughs> Five more minutes. OK. Uh, there was another question. Yep. Yeah, you have to worry about all the TLS things. You have to worry about all the TLS things. So basically, this is, this is inheriting the security properties of TLS. So if you have problems with TLS, you're going to have problems with this mechanism. Yes. Yes, 100%. I haven't thought through, like, I, you did a great question. I mean, you give us talk to 400 people and you find problems. And yeah, like, like you're going to have to think about TLS security in order for this to actually be reliable. It, it inherits its security properties from TLS. OK. Good. Um, so, you know, just to, to wrap this up, right, so we talked about four different kinds of MFA. Phone-based MFA, great for consumers, easy to use. Most consumers, no one's going to sim swap ra random person, they're not worth it, right? SS7 attacks are pretty painful. If you're the CEO of a company that controls a lot of money in a bank account, maybe. If you're, you know, Bob Smith, who, you know, runs a store, no one really cares, right? You're just not worth it. So, so. Um, so, you know, phone-based MFA is great for consumers because it's easy to use, but it's subject to both the phishing and the stolen phone number attacks. TOTP, um, much better security because we're not subject to all these phone, phone number attacks, but we still have the MFA phishing. Push-based MFA, more usable for employees. MFA fatigue, potentially still phishing. Thank you to my friend over there who came up with the attack in the talk. Um, and... Um, WebAuthn, right, um, this is probably the best security that we have. It was raised in the room that TLS is also, it's dependent on the security of TLS, so you have to worry about the security of TLS. Um, I think the biggest con here is that this is new. We don't, we, we don't have a lot of experience with it. It's maybe not that easy to use. I think the market kind of believes that this has to be done with hardware keys. I don't think this has to be done with hardware keys. I think you can use Windows Hello with WebAuthn, which comes on your laptop. I don't know how you administer this across a fleet of laptops in a company when people are using a bunch of different operating systems. So there's a lot of operational headaches for this kind of tech. Um, but at least it's a more robust security model where we're depending on the security of TLS. And the good thing about depending on the security of TLS, I would argue, is that everything depends on the security of TLS. So it's OK to, to sort of <laughs> pin our security to that. Um, last thing I'll say, I'll just wrap up. Um, Another thing that we're really interested in in Bastion Zero specifically, what we do is we provide access to uh, production infrastructure in any cloud or data center. One of the things that we do think about a lot is also just like where is your MFA going? Because um, the last thing I wanted to say, who remembers the Okta breach? Chez, there were several the last couple years. So in the Okta breach, what happened was the Okta identity provider was um, breached. And if you're using Okta as your uh, decision-making point for access to all of your services. If Okta's breached, then you're potentially at risk. 
If you've ever seen, if you've ever been in an organization that uses hardware keys, the way that people used to do hardware keys was that they would authenticate um, to directly to the servers or directly to the, whatever you were trying to access, right, to the service itself. Um, today, a lot of the times, we will use the MFA and authenticate directly to the identity provider. So what that does is that if Okta is breached, um, the use of MFA is not going to protect you because the system that you're MFAing to is the one that was breached. So one of the things that we think about and that I suggest for people to think about when they're thinking about really valuable systems, the point that you're, you're doing the MFA authentication to should potentially be distinct from the one that you're using for password management, like your identity provider. That's one of the things that we provide with our tool. Um, but you know, I just wanted to point out that there's kind of like two considerations here, is like what tech are you using for MFA and who is actually validating your MFA? Because the party that's validating your MFA, if that's the same party for everything, then you're really at the mercy of that party. So if Okta is your MFA server, service as well as your uh, password service, then if Okta gets breached, then you lose security you know, across everything as well. So there are technologies that you can use to, to do MFA, but not to have it go to your identity provider. Um, and so I'm happy to talk more about that, but I, am, I guess I'm gonna stop now because I'm out of time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thank you.